But then there are the countries that can ill afford to import food, but whose domestic capacity to grow food is so disrupted that they must move, buy food abroad to have food enough to eat at home. These low-income, net food importing countries could and should grow a lot more food than they do. Much of what they import is inferior in quality, culturally inappropriate, and it depresses the necessary spur to domestic production that could generate jobs, capital, and a basis from which they could hope to eradicate poverty. Many of these countries have been impoverished by a vision for economic development that promised wealth through exports. It turns out that for them, trade is part of the problem, not a solution. Globalizing world food markets increases the supply of some foods, but it actually reduces the supply of many others. Changes in land tenure laws, for example, prompted by investment clauses in trade agreements, have allowed foreign investors to buy agricultural land in a number of countries. Their investments have reduced production of food crops in favor of commodities like tobacco, coffee, or soybeans for animal feed, or palm oil for biofuel feedstock. The local economy gets an infusion of capital and sometimes new jobs, but the nutritional status of the community suffers and the net distribution of wealth within the community is often unequal, exacerbating existing gaps between the rich and the poor. Opening markets increases choice and competition among suppliers which can lower prices, but opening markets also increases competition among consumers. That can work for television or cars. You have to have money if you want to be part of the market, and if the goods aren't essential, we might accept that not everyone can participate. Food is different. Everyone has to eat. A functioning food system cannot just let prices fall where supply and demand dictate. Policy choices determine whose demand is effective in the market. And if we price those who live in poverty out of the market, then we need to find other ways to protect their right to food. In effect, the model of globalization adopted and implemented over the past two decades in most every corner of the world has priced hundreds of millions of people out of their local food markets. A term that helps frame some of the elements of a better strategy is food sovereignty. First coined by a movement of peasant organizations at the 1996 World Food Summit in Rome called La Via Campesina, Food sovereignty was introduced to counter the argument made by many governments that free trade was the solution to food security problems. Food sovereignty is the assertion of people's right to determine democratically how to protect and promote the universal human right to food. The term emphasizes the role of politics in realizing food security. It emphasizes the importance of who is making decisions. Food security is not just a technical or numerical objective say, securing 2,500 nutritionally adequate calories per person. It's about what people eat, whom they buy it from, whose livelihoods are supported, and whether everyone can afford to buy the food that's available. The question Lavia Campesina posed is whose interests within countries is served by the push to deregulate trade. National welfare can rise, and food security can be achieved at a national level while millions go hungry. That's a fact many rich countries struggle with. La Via Campesina's domestic political struggles informed their position in global negotiations. Local control of food systems and democratic decision-making are two of their fundamental principles. I want to conclude with some proposed principles that could guide our work to build a stronger framework for trade in a fairer and more, food, and more sustainable food system. First, we need to protect and promote the universal human right to food. Our food systems must provide enough food for all. We need to acknowledge that agriculture is not only about the production of commodities. Agriculture plays a vital role in meeting material, but also social, cultural, and environmental objectives. Food policies have to respect goods that have no market price, like our air and our water. And they need to respect the spiritual significance of crops like maize for Mexicans, or rice in many Asian countries. We need to build local food systems. For many of us, that's rebuilding food systems that were there but have been destroyed. It doesn't mean a prohibition on trade or food autarky. It means that food security is built from the local first, respecting environmental constraints and bearing in mind the environmental cost of importing food from outside. Whose land are we using when we buy that food? We need to privilege local knowledge and technologies. Farhad has given us a, a wonderful example of how that is put into practice in Bangladesh. It's not only to promote biological and cultural diversity, but also to give us the resources we're going to need in a world that is grappling with climate change. 
We need to lower carbon emissions. emissions. Agricultural production, land use and transportation of food make agriculture the second biggest um, sector for greenhouse gas emissions. We need to cut waste. The Stockholm International Water Institute has recently estimated that the world, has, the world wastes half the food it grows. Half. And a lot of it is thrown away in our own kitchens, but it's wasted all over the world for different reasons in countries rich and poor. Finally, trade policy can't work in isolation from the rest of the economy. It can't be determined apart, as the World Trade Organization is currently apart from the rest of the multilateral tr system. For trade to be a useful tool, it has to be a piece of a bigger vision for what we want from our economies. We have an opportunity here, I think, an opportunity to make a shift, a paradigm change, if you like, to build a fairer and more sustainable food system. We need new measures of health, wealth, and food security, Farhad's work exemplifies the possibilities of how we could build that. As a major producer for world markets, Australia is in a great position to be a leader for these kind of changes. We need new measures of success, a new understanding of what we're striving to achieve, greater respect for the planet's limits, and greater respect for one another. I don't think it's too much to ask. Thank you. <laughs>